these places we lived in, they were all pretty much hostile countries. They were all avowed enemies of the United States. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. In this fascinating interview, Patrick D. Joyce recounts his unique experience growing up as the son of a US diplomat during the Cold War. Living in the diplomatic community of the Soviet Union, Nicaragua and Cuba, Patrick shares vivid memories of his father's career as a Soviet and linguistic expert who rose to become deputy ambassador at both the Moscow and Havana US embassies. The discussion touches on the juxtaposition of ordinary family life in various US embassies around the world, alongside the extraordinary circumstances of espionage and international relations, highlighting the complexities and contradictions of living in hostile countries during tense political times. The narrative weaves through personal anecdotes, school experiences, interactions with local populations and the evolving geopolitical landscape, providing a deeply personal lens on historical events. I'm delighted to welcome Patrick to our Cold War conversation. Well, you know, it's it's a funny thing, Ian, because, you know, when you're growing up as a kid, the life that you lead is... You, you think that it's an ordinary life and that this is just the way things are. And so it's been a long, slow journey to realize that I had any kind of an interesting life in some senses. So let's start at the beginning. I mean, where were you born and who so, was in your so, family? Okay. So I was born in Thailand. At the time, my parents were stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Burma, now Myanmar, They had been posted in the Philippines before that. So this was my father's second posting as a foreign service officer for the U.S. government. He was someone who had come from a a small town in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, uh, a town that was so small, he basically went to school in a one-room schoolhouse and his mother was the teacher. I, I imagine he had dreams of traveling and he was always really smart. He became a really brilliant observer and analyst of Soviet affairs eventually, who was fluent in Russian up to the level of a PhD. The Foreign Service rates its language training as sort of what sort of educational degree can you speak with confidence at? So he was able to speak with a Russian PhD about PhD level topics. And that's sort of where he came to. He was basically a Soviet expert in Foreign Service, and it took him some time to get to that point, but he also spoke Spanish and German fluently. He was brilliant in languages. But he he was sort of the center of the story. So I, I'll talk a little bit about his background, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. He, yeah. So he basically, after college or during college, he was recruited. He went into the Air Force and the Air Force gave him his initial training in Russian language skills. And the reason they trained him in Russian was so that he'd go up into it. I, I believe he was on C-130s over the North Sea, listening to Russian or Soviet radio transmissions. So he was basically trained in Russian by the Air Force. He was not a pilot, but he was trained to go up into these planes and listen to the radio transmissions and transcribe them and deliver them back to the U.S. So this was his sort of initial foray into that kind of world. After the Air Force, he did some more coursework um, at the University of Colorado, but he never actually got any higher degrees. And it was different about him as a Foreign Service officer Uh, later in his career. A lot of his colleagues, maybe even most of his colleagues in the Foreign Service, were people with higher degrees, um, quite well educated, who went to elite institutions. And my father was very much self-taught. He was really a walk encyclopedia. He was uh, super knowledgeable about many, many topics, and it definitely aided him in his career. Uh, (laughs) He eventually rose to positions of deputy chief of mission in both Havana and Moscow in his career. Which we will come on to in a moment. And so the way that sort of diplomatic staff work is they took their families with them to a posting generally? Yes. So the thing about embassies, so embassies around the world, 
are, I think there are these black boxes and people don't really understand what happens inside them. And maybe for good reason, <laughs> in some cases, some of the things you're not supposed to know what happens, what goes on inside them, but they can be really big bureaucracies, depending on the, 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 the capitals that they're located in. In, in world capitals, embassies, U.S. embassies and embassies for other countries can run into the hundreds of, of people, which include families. So they're bureaucracies that have multiple functions. They have consular functions. They issue visas to resident citizens of the host countries. They are sort of the eyes on the ground for the U.S. government. Diplomats observe, report back. They speak for the government. They deliver official messages and clarify policy in person, which is really important. So they do that communication kind of function. They also represent, they disseminate propaganda and they have agencies and their agencies set up to do that. And they have offices and embassies. They support Americans abroad, tourists, business people. They also provide cover for spies. And this is a pretty major function of an embassy. And it's something that I was just sort of barely and gradually aware of growing up. I became more so as I got older and the knowledge I learned about that aspect of the world around me is still, I'm still learning things about that aspect of the kind of places I grew up in. So they can be these giant bureaucracies full of hundreds of people. They can also be very small, the, some missions, consulates in cities that are not capitals, but can be tiny with just a few staffers. But they have multiple agencies represented, not just State Department diplomats, but also Marine Guards who are there to guard the embassy. Other military branches are represented, other federal agencies. The USIA, which is defunct, no longer exists, I believe. The U.S. Information Agency, which was essentially a propaganda arm of the government. In terms of intelligence, you had CIA stations, you had defense intelligence so again, there were the giant bureaucracies, but they were also thriving communities full of families. There were single people, of course, there were families, there were military representatives of the military branches, there were support staff. In the places we, we lived, there were support staff who were actually Soviet citizens in the case of Moscow or citizens of the other countries we lived in who actually worked in the embassies, which presents all kinds of opportunities and problems. I should say something about my mother, too, before going any further. So my dad was a foreign service officer. He was sort of the, the official diplomat. My mother was always the unofficial diplomat. My dad was definitely more of, of an introvert. He was an intellectual and he was brilliant, but he didn't have the same kind of social skills that you would necessarily associate with a, a diplomat. My mom really had the diplomatic kind of people skills. And so they were a remarkable team. They actually met in college and her training was on the job training. An important function of a diplomat is to entertain, hold parties and attend functions. When you're a higher level diplomat in, in an embassy, you also have a responsibility to help, help uh, maintain the morale of an embassy if you're managing it. In our final posting in Moscow, when the ambassador uh, selected my dad to be his deputy chief of mission in the late 80s. One of the considerations apparently was my mom came along as part of the package. He really believed that she would help with boosting morale to embassy. I, I guess one thing you have to understand, Ian, is that all of my memories of these places we lived in, they weren't places like these glamorous places like Paris and, and, and London, where you would expect a certain kind of life for diplomats, but they were all pretty much hostile countries. They were all avowed enemies of the United States in the Cold War. And so that sort of set up lots of kinds of problems when you're uh, living with your, you know, a, a family, a diplomatic life in these countries. But the first country that I really saw with memories of living in was in Soviet Union, in Moscow in the middle 70s. So that was during Brezhnev's time. And my brother and I were both in grade school at the time. And so for us, we attended an international school, which was English speaking. And the teachers were Scottish and Australian and American. And the school was set up by the U.S. Embassy and some other Western embassies to basically educate the children, mostly of diplomats. But I believe that there were some children of business people and journalists, although children of journalists I know often went to Soviet schools too, or sometimes they did. But in any case, my brother is three years younger than me. 
And the way that we sort of spent a lot of our lives was in this international school with a really amazingly diverse student population. My friends were not only from the U.S., but from Norway and Tanzania and Nigeria and Ireland. <laughs> it's really incredible. So it was also a place that was a compound. The school was a compound. It was walled off. And this is sort of a pattern that's replicated over and over again in our lives behind the, the Iron Curtain in Moscow in numerous ways. So the, the school was this place we went to. It had a, had a playground like any other school. It had school buildings. But we were completely insulated from everything around us in the neighborhood where the school was located in downtown Moscow. As probably I'm sure a lot of your listeners are aware or people who are familiar with the life of, of diplomats or Westerners in Moscow. This is the way we lived also. And the way the diplomats worked too, everything was in walled off compounds. The embassy was a walled compound containing several buildings. And so there was a Marine guard that checked your passport on the way in. We lived in either walled or fenced off or guarded compounds. We were sort of insulated. Westerners from a variety of countries lived in high-rise buildings in different parts of Moscow where no Soviet citizens lived. And there was always a booth at the foot of the building containing, at all times, a Soviet militia guard. And so this is sort of a pattern that was replicated over and over in both physical ways and metaphorical ways. Did yeah. you see much of Moscow? Did you go and visit places while you were there? Yeah, so... It's funny. It was really a life of contradictions. It was full of incongruities because we were both physically and figuratively separated in so many ways. But we also were pretty much free to move around the city and there were ways to sort of peek through the walls and there were opportunities for human contact. My brother and I would go around the city buses and subways. The embassy also had cars that would take us to special events sometimes or to and from the airport things like that. We used the public parks, which were huge and amazing places. One of my most vivid memories of living in Moscow was in the winter times when some of the parks like Gorky Park would be flooded, iced over, and you could go ice skating. We would skate in the parks like that with other Muscovites. We went to the theater. We, I have memories of seeing operas and ballets at the Bolshoi Theater doing some touristy things like that. But again, this was a place where we lived. So in a way, we weren't tourists there. We weren't visitors. We lived there. And the th sort of ordinary things we did, we went shopping in some Soviet stores, mainly the, the memories I have. Shopping were in the bakeries, in the Bulichnayas, which were not so much bakeries, but bread stores full of, well, not always full of, but at their best, they were full of just delicious <laughs> loaves of, of bread, which I would shop at for my mom. I'd bring home um, loaves of bread after school. And that was a very Soviet experience. But at the same time, we also would shop in special stores for foreigners who had Western hard currencies that Soviets were not allowed to shop at. And those had different kinds of goods that were often brought in. Right. And how old were yeah. you at this point? Okay. So I was eight or nine or 10 in the mid 70s. So I was in grade school in first to third grade. My brother was younger than that in kindergarten. So were you allowed out on your own on occasion? Yeah. So when I was that young, we would definitely play in our compounds alone. I'm not sure if I would, as that young, sort of wander off from my parents in the middle of Moscow. So most of my interactions probably with other people on my own were in our building compound with other Westerners. I have memories of one of my friends who lived in the compound was British, and we would reenact the war for independence, him against me, or him and his brother against me and my brother, <laughs> in the field that was between two buildings in our compound. Um, but yeah, and then at that point, my parents employed a Russian nanny for us times when we weren't at school, when they had functions to go to or when they were at work and we were home from school. So we actually had a Russian nanny at home with us who I remember pretty well. And so I actually knew some Russian at the time, which I managed to unlearn later because our next tour in Moscow was not for a number of years. But 
I still remember the alphabet really well. I can sound out letters on a page or a sign and tell you what they sound like. And I know a few words, but that was my sort of experience, I think, from and, having some Russian language at the time. And what, I mean, what was your nanny like? Did they know any English themselves or not? So or think claim she... not to know any English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't remember. My, my memories are sort of vivid, but vague, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. from that time in my life, which maybe is true for a lot of us. But she, I don't remember having a lot of English. So that's why I, I acquired some Russian at the time. Mm. But another thing that's probably a lot of your listeners might not be surprised to know, or maybe already know, is that any kind of employees that we had, any Russian employees, Soviet citizens that were employed in the U.S. Embassy, either in the compound, in the offices, and there were a lot in the support staff, or in our homes, or drivers, people who drove us around, were were they they did those actual jobs, but they also were reporting to to the Soviet authorities, to the KGB, and keeping tabs mm -hmm. on us and letting letting them know what what they were observing. So it was another way in which there is this. We were surrounded by these contradictions where these people were doing their actual jobs, but they're also doing these other jobs. <laughs> and were your parents concerned that the that the flat you were in was bugged? So. You know, it's it's a funny thing. I don't remember us ever talking about it, but it was a generally at, at some point, and maybe at that point in my life, it wasn't something I was aware of. Later, I was keenly aware of it, but it wasn't something that I that I don't recall it ever changing the way I the way I lived or or talked at home. I expect it probably affected my parents a lot more the things they talked about. And I, I do know, you know, whenever we wanted to have a conversation about something sen sensitive, we would do it outside. And that tended to be later in life, both in Moscow and in some couple of the other places we served, which where we had similar concerns. So, but you, whenever you picked up the phone Ian, you, we could, you know, we could hear the click, click, click on the other end. Right. So there was an audible kind of indication that you were being potentially recorded or listened to. <laughs> so did the uh, British lads ever manage to overturn the historical result of the War of Independence. <laughs> I remember his brother hit my brother on the head with a trowel. <laughs> I don't think it was res res resolved, but it's funny. So we spent three separate tours in Moscow, and the third one in the late 80s, I actually met this kid again. He was actually happened to be, his family happened to be stationed there again. And so we had sort of a reunion that was fun. But no, no alternate resolution, no alternate history to report than I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, your dad was a political officer at the U.S. Embassy then. What, what did that role entail? So, yeah, he began that tour as an admin and then a political officer. And political officers, as I understand it, would observe and report and provide an analysis for the government back home. So they were sort of the ears and eyes on the ground. And they write telexes, telegrams back home. And I think that's been true for decades and is still true in, in some form or another. So, yeah, that's what he did in his first tour in Moscow and in a couple of other places where he lived. He, he later was also a science counselor in, in our second tour in Moscow, which I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. That was a more specialized kind of function of forging relations, maintaining relations with uh, scientific bodies or scientists mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. So that was interesting too. So you're there 74 to 76. So this is the time of detente. So reasonably good relations there. Now, in the 80s, as you've just mentioned, you return hmm. to Moscow and this is 81 to 83. So this is quite a tense time because this is the death of Brezhnev and Andropov <coughs> is... Right in power and they're getting very paranoid in the Kremlin. Right. Yes, so absolutely. And a lot of my, I definitely have more vivid memories of this and some of the sort of descriptions that I gave from the 70s maybe were more applied to the 80s, but just in terms of the sense of being walled off. But we did still have freedom to move around. I mean, it was always true that if you want to leave the city to go to whether it's to drive into the countryside or to leave the country for vacation, you had to register, you had to get visas. And I, I do recall in 
in the 80s and the early 80s, uh, if we wanted to drive into the countryside to visit churches or other kinds of sea sites or just uh, take short trips, there, there were very few cars on the road along with us, if any, for huge stretches. But there was always one that, that was following you. <laughs> And again, a familiar kind of feature of the, the train of Westerners living in the Soviet Union is that you would have someone from the KGB following you. So that was one aspect of it. I, I remember one thing in the 70s, when you lived in Moscow, you you generally had to use rubles most of the time. And you only used hard currency in the specialized stores for foreigners, Baryoshkas. Now, the way that we got rubles <laughs> changed a little bit. I think in the 70s, it, things were a little bit looser. Probably Westerners, diplomats included, obtained rubles in ways that maybe were not strictly formal or legal. In the 80s, the embassy sort of shut down those kinds of avenues. So you couldn't get rubles in informal methods and black market methods. You had to actually buy them at a very expensive rates through the embassy from the Russian government. That was one sign. And it affected us in the sense that there were certain staples that you needed to buy in Moscow you couldn't send home for. And so it, it you know, that was one aspect of, of life that was a little bit different. But I think in terms of the way that my life was affected, so at this time, Ian, I was actually not living full time in Moscow. I was now in boarding school. And this was a decision that, that my parents made rather than having me attend a Soviet school, which was a, an option, or having a private tutor, we decided the best thing to do was for me to go to boarding school and visit uh, for summers and winters. And that was a typical thing that American diplomats did with their kids. And the reason we did that is our international school did not include high school or secondary school. So we didn't have that option at that age. So I spent a lot of time going um, through airports, <laughs> through the, the airport in Moscow, and had a lot of experiences there too. That's sort of another vivid memory was standing in line in the diplomatic queue at Sheremetyevo Airport in Moscow. And I did that quite a bit. And it was sort of an, an eerie experience. What made it an eerie experience? Well, I, I think that one thing that I remember is the absence of cameras, which is not something that you would necessarily expect to miss. But when you're in an airport and you're greeting people, at least I remember people would sort of snap photos all the time. And that was something that was completely off limits in Soviet airports. You couldn't have a camera or take pictures. And also just the huge queues, having this sort of special treatment rather than waiting in the queues for ordinary foreigners, Westerners visiting Moscow, we were sort of shuttled around to special diplomatic booths where we usually could get through quicker and our carry-on luggage was not searched. And sort of to be separated out like that was sort of a strange kind of experience that I never got used to. And so it was, again, another sort of a pattern of how we led this life that was both privileged and yet also sort of just very insulated. And it wasn't exactly a gilded cage, but sometimes it felt like that. It was a gilded cage that you could sort of take with you and you could, of course, always leave the cage. You could leave the country. But I think that it was always sort of a strange kind of experience. Uh, so, yeah, but we basically, in terms of growing up as a kid, as a teenager at this point, I don't think I personally felt greater tensions. In, it wasn't something that really impacted me in a way that I can remember. One thing that we did as kids in Moscow was there was a summer camp for American kids, and I think maybe for other kids from other countries too, but it was run for, by the U.S. Embassy. And the, the embassy rented a dacha in the outskirts of Moscow, sort of a country home with pretty fairly large grounds. And so there would be a school bus, an actual American school bus that was shipped in, and it would pick us up at the embassy early in the morning and shuttle a busload of, of American kids out to the dacha for the day camp. And it was called Camp Waxham, which is Moscow spelled backwards. We actually did this in the 70s when I was kids. In the early 80s, my summer job was a camp counselor at Camp Waxham. So this is exactly the kind of thing that I might have done as a teenager in the U.S. And I'd actually spend time in between the first two Moscow postings in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., 
So that's a whole nother story about how weird that was for me. But in Moscow, I was a camp counselor at an at a American camp in Moscow. And right next door, our camp was again, walled off. There were walls on three sides. And then there was a creek running through the back of the grounds. And right next door to us was a young pioneers camp. So it was a camp for Soviet kids. And a few weeks ago, I was talking with my brother and we were sharing memories. And one of the stronger memories he had as a kid going to this camp was remembering how right next door was this camp and you really couldn't tell what was going on. Occasionally, if you were out in the road, you could see through their gates, you could see all the kids in their uniforms and their red kerchief marching, but we had no contact with them. And so sort of an incongruous experience. We, we were aware that they were there, but really no contact. So, so they didn't accidentally kick a football over or anything like that that you had to return? No, I don't remember anything like that, Ian. <laughs> that, that would have been a great experience to have. <laughs> um, maybe the, the football wouldn't have been returned. Yeah. I mean, being older at that time, were you able to travel independently in Moscow? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So at that time, we had lots of freedom. My brother and I had lots of freedom, and Rob was actually living there full-time. He was still in grade school, and he would actually play football or soccer and also ice hockey with Russian kids outside of our building. This was on a parking lot that was iced over. It was a pretty rough and tumble kind of place to ice skate, and I, I remember ice skating, just like in the parks. Uh, they had smooth ice skating rinks too, but memory of ice skating in, in Moscow was over places like this where you really had to watch your step. He would play ice hockey and football with Russian kids. After they played, it was congenial and fun, but it didn't extend beyond that at all. This is the, the early 80s. It was very clearly understood on all sides that you didn't form friendships beyond that. They couldn't come into our buildings because we had that um, military guard standing outside and uh, it was understood that we didn't take friendships with them any further but it was on both sides actually it, it wasn't just that soviets were preventing this but also our embassy was advising its staffers and family members that you couldn't go you can only go so, so far in relationships with soviet citizens and understandably given all the very complicated scandals and that would crop up from time to time <laughs> and thinking, you know, in the mid eighties, there was the U S Marine guard who was caught and uh, arrested and sent home after getting too close to the Soviet citizen. But at the same time, there were a lot of opportunities for sort of human connections with Russians in Moscow. Like I said, we would do things side by side, just out and about in the city. And there was that kind of a contact. We also, like I said, there were Ru uh, Russian staff members working in the embassy and so that was an opportunity both for us to talk about <laughs> what it was like in america and and they were keen and eager to know about that kind of a thing and it was also an opportunity for as i mentioned before for the soviet authorities to have an ear on what was going on ears and eyes inside the embassy and but that was still happening in the early 80s Late, later on when things things worsened um, support staff, Russian support staff were removed from the embassy for years, but I wasn't there at the time when that happened. Did you get into yeah. any scrapes when you were out and about or not? You're very well behaved. Yeah, so I did, and I was a pretty good kid, Ian. I, I didn't get into That's any, not what any we want to like hear, that. Patrick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but <laughs> I know it isn't. And you know, I have firm regrets about that, Ian. And so when, <laughs> I've... Uh, one of the ways that I've, I've, I've sort of, I told you I've had, I've had this sort of long, slow, gradual awakening about the kind of, 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 of life that, or the world that I was surrounded by growing up, and something that I haven't really touched on so much about, uh, about the fact that I was actually surrounded by, essentially by spies and imposters, people who I thought I, I knew I didn't actually, and also the kinds of things that the potentials for, for scrapes and dangers and, and things to happen, just being out about in Moscow, just. I guess that's one of the things when you grow up and you you think that the life you're leading is normal, you don't really imagine the, the potential for problems. You just go about your life and enjoy it any way you can. And so one of the ways I've sort of dealt with these questions and the what ifs is that I write novels now. 
So with all the what ifs and my novels are basically about kids, Western kids who are growing up in embassies and the kids of journalists behind the Iron Curtain. And so lots of room for speculation about the kinds of scrapes I might have gotten caught up in. Right. We put links to your books in the episode notes there. So after Moscow, you are put into Managua, the capital of, of Nicaragua. Now, this is 83 to 85. So the Sandinistas have overthrown Somoza, the uh, former dictator of Nicaragua. And also this is the height of the Contra War. So presumably Americans aren't particularly popular in that country at that time. Yes. Well, OK, so so yeah, so this is so Nicaragua is, is essentially a Soviet satellite now, right? It's, it's receiving military aid. It's an, an, an ally of the Soviets. And it's also, like you mentioned, it's a loca- location of a proxy war. So this is something, it's very different. It's a very different kind of situation from Moscow. Where, well, I always imagined that we were pretty safe in Moscow because it's the last place that anyone wanted anything bad to happen. Nobody wanted any kind of actual, the Russians or the Americans didn't want anything bad happening um, in Moscow. Right. Too many fingers hovering over too many big red buttons. You didn't want things like that to happen with you know, direct contact between our citizens of our countries. But this, this is a little bit different, and the sort of incongruities of living as a Western diplomat here were a little bit different. So there were all kinds of signs of sort of the presence of the conflict which was happening. It wasn't happening in Managua. There was no Contra activity there uh, against the government. There, the, the violence was in other parts of Nicaragua, which is a pretty large country in Central America. But... The signs of, of the conflict were there were armed soldiers all over the place. And it was really fascinating and actually sort of scary that a lot of the, the armed soldiers in, in Managua, we would just see sort of on in our neighborhood, on streets, downtown. And Managua also, in addition to all these problems that they were undergoing and the fact that they just had a recent revolution, the downtown of the city had been devastated by an earthquake fairly recently. It was not a place that was built up. It was partly in ruins, in addition to being sort of engaged in civil war in other parts of the country. So there were soldiers who often seemed to be teenagers and sort of roaming the streets. And so there was this sort of ever-present threat of violence that was more palpable than anywhere else that I lived. So you could sort of feel that the embassy had bulletproof cars, whereas in Moscow, when we were driven in embassy cars to certain places, we had our own cars too, which we used most of the time. But for certain functions or occasions, you would go in in an embassy car and it would be bulletproof. The entrance to the U.S. embassy compound, you would have Marines checking cars as they entered with those mirrors on the ends of long poles to see if there was anything in the undercarriage of the car to make sure there was nothing down there that could be dangerous. At the same time, frequently outside the embassy, you would have American citizens who had traveled to Nicaragua who are peace activists protesting the U.S. government. And this is something that the Nicaraguan government welcomed. And often, I believe that they actually maybe even funded trips or assisted peace activists who came down there and they would protest outside the embassy, protest basically the funding of the Contras and there was the CIA mining of the Nicaraguan harbors. I don't remember exactly when that was. But yeah, so there were these protests right outside the embassy. So we were dealing not only, the embassy staff were dealing not only with a hostile post government, but also somewhat hostile, peaceful activists. And they would occasionally request meetings with embassy staff, which were granted. And I remember my father would occasionally meet with representatives of of protesters in the embassy. And I remember he always had a a really admirable kind of approach to that, that he would meet them and be really respectful and listen to them. And he wasn't someone who was setting policy. He was, I think he was a political officer at that point in Nicaragua, but he would listen respectfully and so he, he didn't see them as an annoyance, really. Right. So so these people were yeah. like protesting outside the gates, but 
if they got into exactly. any trouble, then they would want to seek assistance from the people inside the gates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So going back to that, this is a place where still this is one of the functions of the embassy was to provide support to American citizens abroad, and there were quite a few yeah. at the time. So. Did you travel <laughs> much around Managua on your own, or was it sort of like you had to watch your step? Yeah, so this is, again, one of the aspects of, of life there as a teenager that I look back on, and I'm just sort of amazed at the kind of things that we did. My, my brother and I were, were moved around the city pre pretty freely. I was in boarding school here, and he would be joining me shortly, but he was still attending an international school here. And this is a school that was basically open to anyone it was an English speaking school. Anyone in Nicaragua could basically afford the tuition. Um, but there were Nicaraguans who went to the school. There. Most of the friends we had in Managua when we were teenagers there were people we met who he knew from school or who we both knew from the school. And so there were Nicaraguans as well as people from Sweden and Colombia and the US and just really everywhere, Canada. And most of them diplomats, but not all of them. Some of them people whose parents were doing business in Nicaragua. And we moved about the city very freely. I remember we had this photograph of the group of us posing with a Sandinista soldier who was probably not much older than we were. And he had an AK-47. I just look at that picture and I just think, what were we doing? And he was smiling. He was happy to have this picture taken. But we would take road trips outside the city. There was a volcanic lake that we would go swimming in. It was sort of a popular swimming hole for people. And we went to the beaches. And and again, fighting was not taking place anywhere nearby. And you didn't get hassled because you were American? No, I don't remember. And this was one of the kinds of things, Ian, that even in the Soviet Union, too, when you met ordinary you know, residents of the city where you were living, it wasn't fraught with hostility. There was curiosity. And in Moscow, it was always, you know, how do you like it here? <laughs> Are you liking living in our, our country or city? And in Nicaragua, it was the same kind of thing. Nicaraguans, I think, had, had lots of contact with people from the United States going back years, both positive and negative. So... Mm -hmm. There wasn't that kind of that I encountered as a teenager, right? And have you um, still got that photo of you and your brother with the Sandinista soldier? Yeah, it was me and my brother and our friends. And you know, I've been looking for it. I know it's somewhere <laughs> in my photo albums. And you can um, see, I'm thinking I... it would be a great episode cover for the episode. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. I will I'll double down the next week or so and see if I can track it down. But yeah, okay. it's a remarkable kind of photo and I'm aching to find it. Yeah, sounds great. Another sort of hallmark of this place. Well, this was maybe the first time where I became conscious of the fact that embassies were filled with spies, people who I knew were actually undercover CIA agents or defense intelligence agents. And... And the way I became aware of this is, so there was one day my father took us aside. We went for a walk outside the house because there was a chance that our house in Monaco was bugged. It probably was. And I think the surveillance was not as extensive as it was in Moscow, but it was probably still happening to some extent. So he took us aside and told us, okay, so in the coming week in the embassy compound, there's a good chance you're going to see somebody you recognize. He'll be visiting for about a week. You'll see him probably, but you don't want to call him by name. It's best if you just don't approach him or talk to him at all because he will be going by a different name. He won't be going by the name that you know. Someone we had known, he was the father of a friend of ours, a pretty good friend of ours in Moscow just a couple of years before. And so dad didn't really explain, but somehow it was understood that basically this guy was undercover. He was here under an assumed name and he was going to be visiting for some time. And we, we were sort of just advised to stay away and just to prevent any kinds of problems happening. And so this is sort of my, my introduction to that aspect of life in an embassy to all of a sudden realize that, oh, somebody who I had known fairly well 
And this was somebody who was like this really sort of outgoing, friendly guy, family man with a, a couple of kids. And <laughs> it was actually someone quite different than, than we, had, we had thought. Yeah. Why is your father being stationed in Nicaragua when he's a Russian expert? I, I don't know if I ever asked him that question. One of those things that you sort of just assume that, oh, well, this is the normal course of things. This is the way things are. And But I would imagine it was because they were a Soviet ally. It was sort of an arms pipeline that was set up in our, the next posting we were in, also in Cuba. Same kind of thing. But yeah, so he was fluent in, in Russian, but he actually also did Spanish training and he was really brilliant with languages and he very quickly became fluent in Spanish. I think maybe he had a little bit from when he was growing up in Colorado. It's possible that, that the ambassador there or someone else in the embassy requested that it sort of just made sense to have someone like him on staff right. at the embassy. So yeah. after Managua... You, as you've just uh, said a moment ago, <coughs> you were into Havana, so Cuba this time, and your your father's got a promotion. Yes, so this is directly removed from Nicaragua to Cuba, and also this is an aspect. Of one of the things when you live a, a life like this, a diplomatic life, which I imagine is similar to living a life in a military family, is you move frequently every two to three years. That's really sort of the the feature of your life. Is you're not really getting to know any particular place very well, unless you go back, and even then it sort of just disjointed, disjointed. So after sort of a summer in Washington D.C., we then moved directly to Havana. And again, by this time I was in college, so I visited for summers and winter, and the same goes for my brother. And so my, my father now was the deputy chief of missions in Havana, and Havana was not an embassy, strictly speaking. It was an interest section, which technically was actually a department of the Swiss embassy in Cuba, because the U.S. did not have formal relations in Cuba. So instead, we had this entity called an interest section. And the Cuban government had a similar kind of setup. I believe it was in name, technically affiliated with the Czechoslovakian embassy in Washington, if I remember correctly, not positive about that. But so we didn't have an ambassador. So my, my father was the deputy. And briefly at the end of our tour there in 1989, he was the acting chief of mission there when there was sort of a turnover in the chief of missions. So yeah, so that was his promotion. And Cuba, so sort of the social boundaries, all three of these places that I lived in, they were slightly different in every place. And maybe sort of the most, the most strict, the most walled off, the most insular was always in Moscow. And the, the least, the most porous, the least insular was Nicaragua, as I described. In Cuba, it was sort of something in between where we had sort of more, more contact and maybe a little bit more freedom than we had in Moscow, but it was still a pretty insular community. But the kind of place we lived was really different too. We lived in a house in this western suburb of Havana, which had been formerly the homes for, I think, probably a lot of the really wealthy population of Havana before the revolution, so in the 50s and earlier. And it was rumored that Gabriel Garcia Marquez had a, still had a home there he was sort of an ally, a friend of, of Fidel Castro. So we lived in pretty nice digs at this point, uh, definitely super different from the way most Cubans lived. And when we were in Moscow, we probably had larger apartments. So we definitely had larger apartments than ordinary Soviet citizens. But we lived in high rises and massive buildings, much like they did even if we led a much more privileged lifestyle and had much more access to more, materially speaking. But in Cuba, we were living in these really nice houses, most of the people around us, or rather the ordinary Westerners living in the same neighborhood. So this was a little bit different. There was also more outright hostility when we lived in Moscow. There wasn't outright hostility towards Americans on the part of the Soviet government. <laughs> but... If you were in the interest section building, now the embassy building is still the same building. The high-rise building in downtown Havana facing Havana Bay. When you looked out from the embassy or the interest section building, you could see 
the bay in front of you and a monument to the USS Maine, which was an American ship that had sunk in the harbor during the Spanish-American War. In front of that, you could see this giant billboard, which you can find pictures of on the internet. It's a wonderful billboard. It's basically this cartoonish Cuban revolutionary with a palm tree behind him shouting at Uncle Sam across a small sort of stretch of water saying, imperialistas, we have no fear of you in Spanish. This billboard was facing our building so that it was clear what the attitude was towards <laughs> the United States. That was a different kind of thing to look out on and see. Yeah. The, did, did you get uh, out much in Cuba? Yeah. So yes and no, and there's a reason for that. We, we were able to explore the city. And if you've ever heard descriptions of Havana at that point in time, and it's, I imagine it's worse now, it's sort of like a city trapped in time. Cars left from before the, the revolution, uh, sort of vintage cars in the 1980s at the time that, that we lived there, and buildings in various stages of disrepair, so we experienced a lot of that. We were able to take some trips outside of Havana and explore a little bit. Mainly, we would travel to beaches, and these were beaches that I don't remember if they were Cubans. I remember there being a lot of Canadians on the beaches we went to. Canada had formal relations with Cuba. And so there are a lot of Canadian tourists I remember visiting Cuba. I have one memory of going with my father on, I believe it was actually a converted, probably an old American cargo plane that was converted for passenger use, the kind of plane that you sort of walk up the back, enter from the rear of the plane and walk in. And we went to the Isle of Youth, which was a small island off of Cuba. And I don't remember why we went there. I imagine my dad had some kind of business there <laughs> or was, was meeting with someone on some kind of official trip. But one of the reasons that I didn't actually explore Cuba a lot more than, or I didn't explore Havana as much as I did is I, I had a summer job and my job in Havana was I was working on a construction crew during the summer. It was a 60 hour work week, which was <laughs> a pretty intense job. I was working with basically an American crew of construction workers from Oklahoma who were brought in as part of, I believe, a global effort to fortify and retrofit embassies to make them more secure around the world. It was happening in embassies all over the place. And so there was a lot of work going on on the interest section building, both in the ground level to secure the, the small comp compound around the building, but also on the upper floors to create secure locations within the building. Whereas I might have been doing more exploring of, of the city, my brother and I had hard hats on and we were mixing cement and carrying rebar and drywall along with these older guys from Oklahoma. There were actually some Cubans on the construction crew as well. So it was that was one of these very sort of weird experiences to have in a place like that. Did you ever suspect that your father was working for the CIA or had some other role? Yeah, so so this is something that happened probably around this time. When I was in college, there's a, a couple of things that led me to start wondering whether my dad was actually a spy. And I, my dad actually passed away last year. He, after sort of a, an extended illness and I was able to ask him some questions before that. So I, I was, I, I have resolution on this question, Ian, <laughs> but I won't tell you what, what that is right now. Make sure that I, I tell you later. So a couple of things led me to wonder that. And the first was sort of the, the second major thing that happened to me to sort of open up my eyes to what was really going on in embassies was we were scheduled to leave Cuba in 87 and move to our next posting, which was our third. So the night before we were getting ready to leave, we were all packed up and the Cuban government aired a special news program. And on the, this news program, they had footage, very grainy sort of night vision footage of staff members, foreign service officers from the interest section uh, doing something in the forest, basically doing intelligence drops in the forest, dropping boxes for spies they had recruited. And so this was a huge, huge scandal and something. So I, I was watching, we were watching this as a family 
and <clears throat> there were these were people who I recognized from you know just being around the intersection and knowing them from social occasions. And here they were doing these kinds of intelligence operations in the dark. And now they were exposed for everyone to know who they were. And so the next day we were at the airport and waiting for us there was a Cuban television news crew with mics and cameras. And we we're taken completely by surprise. And my, my father was taken by surprise, I believe. He didn't appear to know that this was going to happen, but I might be wrong about that. <laughs> but we had planned and bought our tickets months before. But the question they were asking my father was, are you fleeing Havana now? Are you fleeing Cuba because of the, the expose, expose that was aired last night showing um, that that Americans were, you know, running these intelligent operations in, in Havana and Cuba. And it was pretty shocking. And he was taken aback. And he, I don't remember him giving them direct answers, but he was also, he didn't hide his displeasure at what was going on. So I imagined um, he had sort of a grim look on his face. And I imagined they probably used that uh, to good effect on their news reports that night. I've never been able to find any kind of footage of that part of it, but you can find on YouTube, you can actually find the expose that was aired showing the grainy, grainy footage of the mm -hmm. sort of the, the CIA operatives leaving their intelligence drops in the forest. So it was really uncomfortable, as you can imagine, sort of being accused of fleeing the country. And at the same time, it was very strange and weird. And I remember not knowing how to act really. It wasn't something that I've ever been prepared for. But I remember thinking, oh, I wish my dad had said something conciliatory or said something, I don't know. So we were walking up the wheeled staircase outside the airplane that we were going to be leaving on. And I just felt the need to do something conciliatory. So I waved to the camera crew before I boarded the plane. Looking back, I don't know why I did that. I just felt the, the urge to do it. And so anyway, that was sort of as a prelude to answering your question, Ian. Uh, when I was in college, I, I took a course on the history of the Vietnam War and had learned that the CIA had filled U.S. embassies in the countries around Vietnam with CIA operatives. And my dad had been stationed in the Philippines and Burma before and during the, the Vietnam War. So I started wondering myself, well, was he, has he all along been like these fathers of friends of mine? Was he actually a spy, an intelligence operative? And I just didn't know about it. And I didn't ask him right away. I basically would just, I started doing research and what kind of research? I don't know. I, I just, I started, I, I think it was one of those kinds of conspiracy theories you enjoy as a kid, maybe wondering if their parents are really the people that they've always thought they were. And so this was maybe times 10 times a hundred. So he wasn't Ian, at least as far as I can tell. And I, I know that people, I've learned about more embassy staffers that I knew as a kid. I've learned since then that they were also CIA op operatives. I learned much later as an adult. That one of them actually went on to become the deputy director of operations of the CIA, father of a friend of mine in, in the, the early 70s. And he came to my dad's retirement party from the Foreign Service. Very strange. And so I keep learning things like this. It seems like it never ended. And I didn't actually know that my dad had flown in those reconnaissance operations for the Air Force until I was an adult. That was one of the things he told me much later. So yeah, this was, it's very weird. It almost feels like there was this life that I was living, that I thought I was living. And even if I was conscious that it wasn't an ordinary life and became more conscious of this, it still feels like gradually over the course of my life, these layers have been peeled back slowly starting when I was a teenager, but they just keep being peeled back. So, and yeah, you know, still lots of, so I think they'll never be answered fully and completely. And that's the nature of it. Right. Okay. Had that's to the ask the question it. though. I had to ask the question. So <laughs> your final sort of cold war posting or your father's posting is 
Deputy Chief of Mission back at the Moscow Embassy. Now, Deputy Chief of Mission, that's effectively Deputy Ambassador. Yes. And this is <laughs> with Gorbachev is now in power. So how different is Moscow to what you'd seen previously? So now at this point, I'm in college and again, still coming back for winters and summers, same as my brother. And it feels as you, I mean, everyone who I'm sure you've talked to says the same thing and it feels incredibly different. And it's, I think it feels different in two ways. One way is that things are more open. I remember going to a jazz club, which was open to foreigners and to Russians. And that was something that you never went to. It was small and sort of a nascent fledgling kind of operation. But a Russian, you know, a Russian run jazz club, which was, I mean, there all along been sort of private secretive kind of things, things like that going on which I had never experienced, but now this is something that anyone can go to. And so, so that kind of openness from Glasnost was something that we felt in just sort of having the mobility and, and going around the city and experiencing things like that. There was also the other kind of difference I sort of alluded to before is that things were also not necessarily better. I mean, that you didn't have the same heightened Cold War tensions as the early 80s maybe when things really actually did come close to war at certain points with, what was it, 1983, mm -hmm. with the Abel Archer kind of operations, which I learned about much, much later. I didn't know about, obviously, at the time. So things might have been a little bit less tense in some respects, but also in spite of Glasnost, there was still lots of tension. There was still lots of sort of espionage and spying. And this is when you had the revelations about American spies and double agents and all kinds of scandals, including the Marine, the Lone Tree scandal, which had happened just before we had arrived. So it was inside the embassy, it was sort of a different kind of tension, um, maybe even increased tensions. The other thing that was happening in terms of embassy life was we now had a new embassy compound. The old embassy compound was this sort of aging, almost rickety building that almost looked like it was just going to fall onto the Garden Ring Road, which is the downtown ring road that it was located on in, in downtown Moscow. And so for some time, the U.S. had been building newer, more modern embassy compounds, obviously with the permission and assistance of the Soviets, a few, not too far away, a few blocks away. And it was finished. And there was room for residences as well as offices. There was an office building in the middle of it, but also residences. And that's where we actually lived at this point. We lived in ta these townhouse type homes inside that new compound. But the embassy, the office building in that new compound was empty and was going unused because another one of the scandals that occurred was it was discovered that the very structure of the building was laden with bugs and surveillance equipment. And so it was completely useless. And it was because a lot of the components, I believe, were actually constructed, built, provided from within the Soviet Union. So you can imagine my father was a deputy chief of missions at this time. He was the acting um, charge d'affaires or chief of mission when the, when the ambassador was not there, but he was responsible for day to day of, of, of the embassy. So for all these reasons, along with all the social and economic upheaval and everything else going on, it was a pretty stressful job. Mm -hmm. This was a pretty tense situation for everyone. Um, I can only imagine the kind of tense situation it was for him. Um, managing an embassy in light of all that was going on. What was it, it like for you in Moscow? Did you get up to much there? Yeah, so same kind of thing, Ian, except maybe just age-wise going to spending, you know, doing different kinds of things, I guess, that were based on being an older teenager, but it was still a pretty insular place. It, it was insular in the sense, it was also very international, which I think came not only from sort of the, the grade school experiences that I had, but also there was a lot of camaraderie among diplomats and their families from different Western embassies. So a lot of the socializing took place 
either at a bar and grill in the US, US Embassy, it was Uncle Sam's. Australians had a popular watering hole called the Down Under. The, Kiwis. the New Zealanders had the Kiwi Club. These are places you could go to with your passport and socialize. There are always embassy functions and parties at different places. The other thing we did in Moscow is that we would take overnight trains to Leningrad. We would also take the same train except further to Helsinki. That was an escape for us. You could do shopping, get fast food. <laughs> People tried really hard to live as ordinary a life as you could in this very walled off existence, but you could only go so far. And so, yeah, so we did some traveling like that. The way we actually left our final tour, left Moscow, was we actually, instead of flying out, my dad decided that we were going to drive. And so we actually drove from Moscow to, I believe, we drove through Poland and through East Germany and into um, West Berlin. And my memories from that are primarily of sort of the landscapes and I think we were sort of constrained for, t for time. And so we didn't actually spend a lot of time, but staying in Poznan at the consulate there and what that was like. And yeah, so it's a very strange kind of escape from Moscow too, which I imagine probably not a lot of Westerners or Eastern Bloc residents did that kind of a road trip. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos, and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters, and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening, and see you next week.